Good morning. morning. Welcome to Grace Church. So glad to see each one of you here today. And as we gather to worship the risen Christ on the Lord's Day, I say to you confidently, He is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. And we celebrate the resurrection every Lord's Day, uh, and especially on Easter Sunday. But I'm so thankful for you to be here and the opportunity we have to worship together. Take your bulletins if you have one. If you don't, now is a perfect time to slip out the back and grab one and stand on the way when you came in. Just a few announcements. Uh, is after the service, we'll have our usual break and then have the Christian Education Hour. We are continuing our study in First Peter, so we'd love for each one of you to stay for that. Uh, important sanctificational opportunities. Uh, prayer meeting is Wednesday. Uh, 6 30 to 7 30 so we'd love for you to be here and pray with us and it's not in the bulletin but i put it in our our weekly email that went out yeah on friday uh, but as you can see the parking lot is coned off and so uh, we're parking here hopefully this will be the last week on the on the north side there um but i when i hear from dr gilgenbach i'll pass it on to you all but hopefully this will be the last last one so thank you for your flexibility there all right, for our call to worship, Brother Don, would you come on up here? Looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 7 and 18 for our call to worship, uh, Paul has just been dealing with a problem of some division factor, and uh, he reminds these folks in, in verse 17, he says he's called to preach the gospel not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We worship a God with power. His power allows us to avoid the, the factor of perishing and become one who's being saved. We worship a great God who is willing to do that despite the fact we are not the holy creatures that we could be. He's the Holy One. He's the power. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that your, the word of the cross is to those that are perishing. And to those that, of us that know you as Savior, it's, it's salvation. We thank you for your great power through all this. Help us, Father, now uh, to... Bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us worship together. Thank you, Brother Don. Turn in your hymnals to hymn number 135, our first hymn this Lord's Day, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. Hymn number 135, if you're able, would you stand with us, please, as we sing. Hymn number 135, O Worship the King.
Amen. Take your insert out of your bulletin on the front side. Uh, it should be the hymn, Christ Jesus Lay in Death's Strong Band, one of our former hymns of the month. We'll sing all seven verses together. Of Christ Jesus Lay in Death's Strong Band on the insert. The good thing about printing this out is that you can uh, take it home and chew on that this afternoon. That's a mighty mouthful of a hymn. Please be seated. At this time, we'll pray for our offering. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank Thee and praise Thee for Your great love for us. We come to a time we call our, our worship with giving. We pray, Father, as we bow our hearts in worship to You, 
We thank you, Father, for all the great resources you've made and give to us. Help us, Father, to concentrate upon you and your love for us as opposed to just the earthly finances we deal with. We ask your blessing now on this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. It is time for our Old and New Testament Bible readings. Please turn to Genesis chapter 11. Pastor was teasing me the other day that uh, I was gone last week and I missed reading all those fun names in chapter 10. Who did that? Did you do that? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> you did chapter 5. Oh, did I? I'm getting good at that. I'm going to catch up today a little bit. All right. Genesis chapter 11, we're going to look at verses 1 through 26. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said one to another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and, and there confuse their language, so they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over all the face of the earth. And they left off the building of the city, and therefore its name was called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. These are the generations of Shem. 
Shem was 100 years old. He fathered Arpachshad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he had fathered Arpachshad 500 years and had other sons and daughters. When Arpachshad had lived 35 years, he fathered Shelah. And Arpachshad lived after he fathered Shelah 40 years, 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Shelah had lived 30 years, he fathered Eber. And Sheila lived after he had fathered Eber 403 years and had other sons and daughters. When Eber had lived 34 years, he fathered Peleg. And Eber lived after he had fathered Peleg 430 years and he had other sons and daughters. When Peleg had lived 30 years, he fathered Reu. And Peleg lived after he fathered Reu 209 years and had other sons and daughters. When Reu had lived 32 years, he fathered Serug. And Reu lived after he fathered Serug 207 years and had other sons and daughters. When Serug had lived 30 years, he fathered Nahor. And Zerug lived after he had fathered Nahor 200 years and had other sons and daughters. When Nahor lived 29 years, he fathered Terah. And Nahor lived after he had fathered Terah 119 years and had other sons and daughters. And when Terah had lived 70 years, he fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Turn to Matthew. We're looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And uh, a lot of times we have a phrase that says, bless the reading of his word. I'd like to suggest we may, that may God bless our understanding as we read his word. You're in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 9 through 17. <clears throat> as you look at this portion of scripture, it struck me that after the basic information of the birth of Christ, it's almost like the Matthew had sat down and was making a journal of all the little things put together because sometimes they don't seem like they're quite connected, but it's like he kept a journal. All right, chapter 9, verse 1. And getting into a boat, he, he, Jesus, crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic, <clears throat> paralytic <clears throat> lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son. Your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he arose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at a table in the house, behold, many tax collectors, collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? 
The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But a new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. May God bless his word. Thank you, Brother Don. It says there in Genesis 11 that they built this tower and this city in the plain of Shinar. Do you know what city was founded in the plain of Shinar? Someone said it. Olive? Babel, yes, which was the precursor for which big city? Babylon. Okay, very good. So interesting, I would say, or divinely providential, that the f- not the first rebellion, but the first community-wide organized rebellion started at Babylon. The last community-wide rebellion is going to end at Babylon as well. And it will come to an end by the return of the Son of Man who has authority to forgive sins, as we saw in Matthew, and authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. For our next hymn, you may take your hymn books and turn to hymn number 378, or you can just pull your insert out. I have all five verses here. There's only three in our hymn book. We'll sing the three in the hymn book, two on the insert, but for your convenience, all five are on the insert if you would like to just use that. Hymn number 378. Soldiers of Christ arise. If you're able, would you stand with us, please? Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. 
for our final hymn turn to hymn number 354. Hymn number 354, The Church's One Foundation. We see in our text today that Jesus prayed for himself first. He prayed for his immediate disciples, but then he prays for the entire church, you and I, every believer around the world from Pentecost through the rapture. He has prayed for us. So let's sing this song about the church, about church's one foundation, number 354. Amen. Would you stand now for the reading of Scripture? Our passage is John 17, verses 1 through 26. Good morning. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. But they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, 
And these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because of they are not in the world, just as I am not in the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me to the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe me through their word, that, may, that they may also be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Where did I go? I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love me, even though, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's pray before we dive into this text. Holy Father, you have spoken to us at many times in many ways in the past, but now most clearly and most finally through your Son. And we have his words written down for us. And we get to watch him pray to his Father and ask you for things. And there's no better teacher we could have than Jesus to teach us to pray. So, Father, help us. Help us to see the glorious truths on these pages. Help us to hear them as the good news that they are. Give us the will to choose to, to receive them and to put them into practice in our lives. Father, as Jesus prayed, we want to see you glorified in all things. We want Jesus Christ to be glorified over all flesh, that he would have all the glory that is rightfully his. So, Father, help us now. Help me to speak your words clearly and boldly. And, Father, give us all ears to hear the truth so that you would be glorified, that your church would be strengthened, that sinners would be convicted, and that we would find our happiness in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been charged with a difficult task? I mean a really hard one that you didn't think you could accomplish. It doesn't matter, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a little child, a teenager, a young adult, an older adult, an even older adult. We get tasked with things that seem beyond us. When you get this hard task, has, has anyone ever come and offered you a word of encouragement? Has anyone ever come along and said, I believe in you. You can do this. You appreciate that, do you not? It's nice to be encouraged, even if you don't share the confidence of the one doing the encouraging. But in the end, that person, unless they do the job for you, they can't make sure, they can't ensure that you succeed in it, right? We can hope, you know, we as parents say, oh, they go do your best, you know, on your driving test, on your algebra test, on your baseball game, etc. Um, 
but we can't make it happen. We've spent a few weeks here looking at Jesus' prayer. Um, It's a glorious prayer. We could have spent a few weeks more. But Jesus prays for things for us. He prayed first and foremost for himself. Uh, He prayed for his disciples who have given up everything to follow him for three and a half years, and they're going to go through the darkest 24 hours of their lives. But he doesn't just stop there. He prays for you and I. He prays for all who would believe in him based on the apostles' teaching. He's praying for the entire church throughout its history, through its global reach. Whether you are sitting in a comfortable padded pew in Otsego, whether you're sitting under a tree in Tanzania, whether you're meeting secretly in a house with the shades pulled, in Afghanistan, or somewhere else. Whether you're meeting with all the other believers in the gulag with you. He's praying for you. Jesus takes the time to pray for and encourage his church. But his encouragement is not like yours and my encouragement. Do your best. We believe in you. Jesus actually is the one who enables us to follow through with what he's called us to do. And what he has called us to do in our passage today is beyond what you and I are able to do in our own strength. We cannot do this. We need his divine enablement. But where Jesus commands and sends, Jesus goes with and empowers And so as we come now to the third section of his prayer, as he prays for you, his church, I think it boils down to this proposition, that you must do what Jesus prays for you. You must do the things which Jesus prays for you. The question is how? How do we do these things? I see five examples here in our text today. Number one, endeavor for unity. Number one, endeavor for unity. Number two, exist in Christ. Number two, exist in Christ. Number three, evangelize the lost. Number three, evangelize the lost. Number four, end in heaven. Number four, end in heaven. Number five, embrace the church. Number five, the final one is to embrace the church. So we'll look at these five here in order in our text today. The first one that you must do is the first prayer request that Jesus prays for you is to endeavor in unity. Endeavor in unity. You see that in in verses 21 to 23. He prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. He says it again um, down in verse 22, that they may be one even as we are one. And then again in 23, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. The first question I ask you is, what is the model for this unity? He's praying for unity for his church. What is the model? It's the Trinity itself. Mentioned there in verse 21, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. The Spirit is not explicitly mentioned in this verse. It's been mentioned already in the process. He's been teaching on the Holy Spirit. So the the Holy Spirit is not absent here. But the model for perfect unity is God himself. Father, Son, and Spirit, all equally one in their divinity, yet distinctly different in their person, in their roles, in their functions. The Son takes a subordinate role to the Father. The Spirit takes a subordinate role to both the Father and the Son. We talk of subordination amongst one another here, and people's fists go up. Who are you to tell me you're in charge? 
Who died and made you king? It's a phrase I often used as a kid. Not with my parents, though. Okay. Um, but there is perfect unity in the Trinity. Father, Son, and Spirit delighting themselves in one another. And we would do well to spend years of our lives just contemplating the Trinity, who they are and what they do. We won't spend years this morning or even hours. But think about this. Before creation, in the foreverness, before time existed, before a molecule existed, Father, Son, and Spirit shared together in perfect unity, perfect happiness, perfect love. No conflicts, no misunderstanding, no sin. The Trinity is our model. We do well to contemplate them. The second question I ask you is, what is this unity? We're to have unity, what is it? Well, this passage does not explicitly spell it out, but I think John has been spelling it out his entire book. It's in the purpose of his book. He says, I write these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name at the very beginning. I don't want to say minimum because there's more than the minimum, but at the very beginning, it is belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah, the promised one. He is God in the flesh. Christian, Christian unity is impossible if there is not unity at that point. You realize it is impossible for us to have theological unity with a Muslim. It's impossible for us to have theological unity with a Hindu. It's impossible for us to have theological unity with a Jehovah's Witness, a secular materialist, or any other professing Christian who does not believe in the divinity of Father, Son, and Spirit. There is no possibility of unity. We could have political unity. We could have statewide unity. We could have geographic, territorial, hobby, hobbies, unity in our hobbies, our sports teams, etc., but there is no theological unity that doesn't start, unless it starts, excuse me, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, for example, in John 3, 16 and 18, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Most of you could probably quote that verse. But listen to the follow-up verse in verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If you do not start with the divinity of Jesus Christ, there's not possible for unity. Our goal is not to seek unity with those who do not believe in the divinity of Christ. Our goal is to seek to share the gospel with them. But it does not end there. This is not the minimum and everything else is fine. Let's, let's hit the minimum. As I said, that's the beginning point. Paul talks about explicitly this unity uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, one of the first passages I preached when I was candidating here. Uh, it says this in verse 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. 
when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Our unity is to be centered around the ever-maturing, ever-growing faith and knowledge in the Son of God. You don't do that without devoting yourself to His Word. How should we believe about the person and work of Christ? Look at the Word. How should we believe about the ordinances of baptism and communion? Look to the Word. How should we believe about the church, its structure, its polity, its leaders, the body, its purpose, its function? Look to the Word. How are we to believe about eschatology and things to come, about angels and demons, about how to grow in the Christian life? Look to the Word. As you grow in your knowledge and understanding of the Word of God, our unity will grow as well. It must be centered around these things. One commentator said it this way, it's not achieved by, unity is not achieved by hunting enthusiastically for the lowest common theological denominator, but by common adherence to the apostolic gospel, by love that is joyfully self-sacrificing, by undaunted commitment to the shared goals of the mission with which Jesus' followers have been charged, and by self-conscious dependence on God himself for life and fruitfulness. These things must shape and form our Christian unity. There are There are things which divide us from other Christians. And some of these ought to. Okay? If someone has a different understanding of what the ordinances are for, what they mean, what they say, or whether or not we should do them, (laughs) that will necessarily cause uh, division. I know of of Christian churches, gospel-preaching churches, that would allow a person to membership without following the Lord's command of baptism. What does that say about the Lord's command? The Lord commands it, but we say, come on in, you can be a part, whether you obey this command or not. So there, there are necessary separation. And it's not to say, how many of our differences can we overlook? But how can we center ourselves on the Word of God? How can we come to a better understanding of the Word of God? Which is the right path? This unity is also a unity of practice, for example, like with baptism, as I talked about. And let me be clear, we're looking for unity, not uniformity. When we are all made more into the image of Christ, we do not lose our distinctions that which makes us different from one another. It's a beautiful thing when Christians lay down their rights and or privileges for one another. We can sacrifice for each other. Let me say this does not mean that you can disobey your conscience. If God is leading you in your conscience to do X, you must do X and you cannot refrain from doing X. If God is leading you in your conscience not to do why, you cannot do why, even if your brother in Christ does why. Okay, these are not explicit commands of Christ. We're talking about matters of conscience. And this unity also does not mean that you can be someone else's conscience. The Holy Spirit gets that privileged role for every believer. And he has not handed it off to you or I. What is the Trinity? Is that, or excuse, what is the unity? I would ask the next question, why? Why the unity? Why does Jesus pray three times for this unity? Well, he says it twice, right in the text. In verse 21, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And look at verse 23. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. We'll flesh this out a little more in our third point. But our unity is for the witness to the world. 
How many of you have ever shared the gospel with someone or having a, a gospel conversation with someone? They say, oh, well, if you're right, then why are there so many different Christian denominations? That's a fun grenade to get from a lost person, isn't it? Because <laughs> there's some good answers to that, and there's also some uncomfortable answers to that. There's been division where there shouldn't be division. And there's been necessary division where Christians are completely wrong on important things. Our unity, brothers and sisters, is important to our witness. And so let me say this to you. If you must speak of a brother or sister with whom you have profound disagreement to an unsaved person, speak more charitably than you know how. Even if you don't agree with everything they do. If they're a brother and sister in Christ, give as charitable of a critique of them as you must in your witness to the unbeliever. Because our witness is at stake. The unity of the body is to be a profound witness to the lost. Jesus says so three times. He prays this, that they may all be one, that they may be one, that they may be perfectly be one. Why did he say it three times? Because it's the most important? No, I don't think so. Probably he knew this would be the hardest one for us to do. He knows how hard it is for us. But Jesus prayed it, and you must do it. Thus, the first way that you do what Jesus prays for you is that you endeavor for unity. The second way is that you exist in Christ. You exist in Christ. You do this totally, completely, just like Jesus did with the Father. There was not a time when Jesus was not walking in perfect unity with his Father. Perfect fellowship. He loved what the Father loved. He did what the Father commanded. His goals were the Father's goals. His desire was to showcase the beauty and glory and majesty of the Father. Brothers and sisters, does this reflect your goals and your thoughts in life? Now remember, Jesus was the God-man. As God, he always has had perfect fellowship with the Father forever and ever. But... As man, the author of Hebrews and Luke in his gospel tells us, Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Jesus had to learn how to read, brothers and sisters. And he learned to read God's word. And he spent extraordinary amounts of time reading and studying and memorizing. He was quoting scripture on the cross. Jesus took time away from the work that God had called him to do to go and pray and be with his Father and refresh his spirit in him. You need to exist in Christ in a similar way that you exist on planet Earth, meaning all the time. There is no time, no matter where you go and what you do, that you don't exist on planet Earth. You may be on land, you may be on sea, you may be in an airplane. You may be in Minnesota, you may be in Israel. You may be at work, you may be at home. You may be awake, you may be asleep, but you're always here on planet Earth. You cannot be unconcerned about the parameters of the planet, or you will die. But the difference in my analogy is that the Earth is not a person. The Earth does not deserve or require your worship. The earth did not die to save you from the wrath of almighty earth and promise you to bring you into perfect fellowship with it. Jesus has done this. And so you must exist in Christ. 
He says that there in verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Your job is to abide or exist in Christ. That's a moment by moment, day by day, hour by hour, month by month, year by year, dependence on Christ. And you need to depend on him for everything. Not only for your physical needs, but for your spiritual ones. You need to be in Christ in order for your, just, for your justification. It puts you in Christ. For your sanctification. Do you want to grow and become more like Christ? Then abide or exist in him. Dwell in him. And if you will reach glorification at the end, you must abide dependent. Just like newborn babies depend on their mothers for life and sustenance. As Peter said in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, so we must long for God and his word. He says, as in like newborn infants long for pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Your dependence, your abiding in Christ is absolutely essential for your growth. Thus, the first way that you do what Jesus prays for you is that you endeavor for unity. The second way is that you exist in Christ. And the third way is that you evangelize the lost. You evangelize the lost. I have read these verses to you already. The purpose of our unity is that the world may know, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And in verse 23, that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. We see first that the lost must believe in verse 21. This is the message of the book of John. This is one of the reasons why I'm preaching through the book of John, to help you and I in our evangelism. The purpose of the book of John is that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, have life in his name. And this is a work that God must do. You can't make someone believe. You can't provide the conviction of their sins. You can't provide the saving blood of Jesus to forgive them. And you can't regenerate dead people alive. I dare you. If you think you can, go to the graveyard and start raising people from the dead. If you can do it physically, then we'll talk about it spiritually. This is a God work. So let me ask you, church, are you asking God to raise the spiritually dead? Are you praying for lost people's salvation? He says in verse 21, the lost must believe, but he also says the lost must know. Make them believing is God's part. The knowing, at least in terms of informing, is our part. The proclamation of the gospel. Are you doing this? You must make the picture clear for them. You must show them from the word of God, his transcendent holiness, their compromised depravity and rebellion against him, and put forth the beautiful crosswork of Christ as the only payment for their sins. That is the message, that is the picture that you and I must share with the lost. And are you showing it with your lives? You know, the lost, they can stop their ears, right? They can physically put their hands in their ears and la, 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 I don't want to hear it. Okay? I've had someone say that, minus the la, la, las. Okay? They can stop their ears. They can walk away from you. They can end the conversation. They can even stop your mouth if needs be, right? Uh, they can physically take our lives from us. But you know what they can't stop? Two things. They can't stop the message of your life. As you live out the gospel before them, 
as the love of Christ overflows from your life, as the grace of God is manifest to them, as your dependence upon Christ is clear day by day, they can't unsee that. And they also can do nothing to stop your prayers. Tertullian once wrote that the heathen, particularly the Roman persecutors, used to exclaim how these Christians love one another and how they are ready to die for one another. This stated by the Romans who were sending them to their death. Could not deny what they were seeing. Are you praying for your neighbors to be saved? Are you praying that God will use you to share the gospel with them? Are you asking the Father to show you the opportunities that you have? My former pastor, Pastor Murray, used to say this, and I appreciate it. He said, stop praying for opportunities to share the gospel. He said, start praying that you would see the opportunities that are there. We'll often sit back and use that excuse, right? Oh, God, give me an opportunity today. Oh, well, he didn't give me one. <laughs> Sorry, couldn't do it today. Oh, didn't give me one tomorrow either. <laughs> didn't give me one Wednesday either. I'd share, God, if you just give me. No, no, they're there, okay? They're there. Pray that God would give us eyes to see the opportunities that are there. Let me make yet another invitation for you to join us on Wednesday nights. We pray in our very first prayers of the night for the lost. And we also pray for those of you who are trying to witness to them. Do you need prayer in your evangelistic efforts? Do you need encouragement? Then come and pray with us on Wednesday night, free of charge. We'll save a seat for you. There's plenty of room. So thus, the first way that you do what Jesus prays for you to do is that you endeavor for unity. The second way is that you exist in Christ. The third way is that you evangelize the lost. And the fourth way is that you end in heaven. You end in heaven. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see the glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Jesus prayed that you would see him in his full, resplendent, awesome glory. I promise you, you haven't done that yet. But that is what he prayed. And when you take your last breath, as death encompasses you, or gloriously as the trumpet sounds and we are raptured out together, you will see Jesus face to face in all of his glory. How do we get to do that? Again, don't call me a broken record, blame John. Believe. Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in this book. But these are recorded that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you would have life in his name. You want to end up in heaven? You want your children, your grandchildren, your spouse, your loved ones, your neighbors, your coworkers, your teammates, your friends to end up in heaven? They must believe the gospel. That's how, but why? Well, that's an easy one. For his glory and our joy. I want them to be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. To see the glory of God is the greatest, most enjoyable thing you will ever do better than your best day you've ever experienced in your life. 
and I can prove that to you. There are a few people in Scripture who are allowed to see the glory of God very briefly. Remember Moses? He said, God, show me your glory, full, unvarnished. God said, Moses, if I do that, you're dead. I will let you see a little bit of my afterglow. Was Moses happier or sadder from having seen a glimpse of that tiny portion of God's glory? Absolutely happier. His face glowed so much that he had to veil his face afterwards. Was Isaiah happier or sadder for having seen the vision of Yahweh exalted in his temple? He was absolutely happier. Or what about John, our author here? Was he happier or sadder for having seen the revelation of Jesus at the end of his life? Happier, absolutely. Even if Jesus was a lot more awesome and fearsome than he had last seen him. Your joy is bound up in seeing and experiencing the glory of God. But we aren't always excited for that glory, are we, when we roll out of bed? At five, six, seven, eight, or nine, God forbid. We're, we're stuck thinking about other things. We get fixated on them. I'm not saying don't do them, but don't miss the glory of God for the mundane things in your life. I don't know of anyone who said it better than C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory. He says, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward promised by our Lord in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday to the sea. We are far too easily pleased. Brothers and sisters, do not succumb to the joys of this world as the end in themselves. Enjoy the good gifts that God has given you, but I promise you, he has something better for you than food and drink and baseball, and vacation, and sex, and work, and money, and retirement, and a cabin. Lots more. He has himself for you. Does your heart yearn for heaven? Are you dissatisfied with this world? And no, I don't mean are you willing to complain about all the things you don't like today. Unbelievers do that quite well. But are you praying for Christ's kingdom to come? That's the second request in his model prayer. Are you praying that? Are you preparing yourself to live in his kingdom and living out those realities now as you're able? Okay? I know that in the kingdom, we will be limitlessly wealthy. And I'm guessing that none of us are that right now. And that's fine. But the kingdom will be about righteousness and justice and peace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you living that way now? Thus, the first way that you do what Jesus prays for you is that you endeavor for unity. Second, that you exist in Christ. Third, you evangelize the lost. Fourth, you end in heaven. And fifth, is that you embrace the church. You embrace the church. You embrace it with God's love. Think, how does God love you and I? Graciously. Is God's love based for you based on your performance for him this week? Shake your heads no. He loves you far more than you deserve from your performance this week. He loves us forgivingly. Is God's love for you contingent on the perfection of your obedience this past week? 
Absolutely not. He loves you despite your sin and rebellion. God's love is also lavish. Let me ask you, is God's love for you in exact proportion as your love for him? No. He loves you far more than you and I love him. And God's love is faithful. Let me ask you, is God's love for you as consistent as your love for him? Absolutely not. When we are faithless, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So embrace the church with God's love that is gracious, forgiving, lavish, and faithful. You want a human example? What about Joseph and his brothers? All right. I despise lots of social media. I despise all of the silly days that we invent, okay? Oh, it's such and such day. It's left-handed black-colored dog day or whatnot, okay? The funniest one I saw was on National Siblings Day. All right, now don't get me wrong. I love my siblings, okay, very much. And I'm very thankful for them. I saw a good one that said, uh, Happy National Siblings Day from Joseph. as his 10 brothers throwing him into a pit, you know? They only threw him in the pit because they could get money out of him that they couldn't get out of his dead carcass. Let's kill him. No, we could use some spending money, boys. All right, let's sell him. And he's forgotten down there for 13 years. And about 11 or 12 of those years are spent in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And yet when they come, and they bow before the vice pharaoh of Egypt. He doesn't rub his hands together and get that glint of the Count of Monte Cristo in his eyes thinking about revenge. He opens his arms and says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Brothers and sisters, do you love the church like that? You don't keep record of wrongs and offenses. And man, that person just rubs me the wrong way. Fair enough. I'll grant you the point. But love them graciously, forgivingly, lavishly, and faithfully the way God loves you. Embrace them with God's love. But secondly, embrace God's people. Embrace God's people. Do you yearn to be with fellow Christians? Do you long to see your brothers and sisters in Christ? Can Sundays not get here quick enough so you can see one another again? Can you not handle the seven days apart so you come on Wednesday night for nothing else but to be with your brothers and sisters and to pray with them and sing hymns with them and fellowship with them? Your eyes light up if you turn the aisle in Coburn's and... There's Alice Olson. So great to see you. There's Robert Apt. Whoa. Man. Embrace God's people. I don't mean exclude your family and ignore your family and starve your family and neglect your family, okay? There's commands about that, 1 Timothy 5, 8, okay? But know for this, you don't know for sure if all of your family will be saved. You can know for sure that all of Christ's church will be saved. And I mean not just everyone who walks through the doors of the church who actually gets on a membership role, but those who have genuinely been born again, as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, they know know me, they follow me, and no one shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. Brothers and sisters, embrace the church. Delight to be with God's people. Thus, the way you do what Jesus prayed for you, 
He prayed this for you and I. It was recorded and we've looked at it. The way you do this is you endeavor for unity. You exist in Christ. You evangelize the lost. You end in heaven. And you embrace the church. Let me ask you, by way of application, then why? We talked about the how. Now why? Why do this? What's your motivation? Because this is a precursor to the kingdom. This is what life will be like in the kingdom. This will be normal. We will be perfectly unified. We will perfectly abide in Christ. We will even, in the first thousand years, have opportunities to evangelize the lost, those who are born into the kingdom, who need Christ. And you will end in heaven and will live forever in a perfect embrace of the church. This is a precursor. Let's do it now. Let's practice now. Why wait? Second, why should you do this? This is how Christ is glorified. We are the body of Christ. We want to bring him glory. We want to show the world how awesome and wonderful he is. And third, because this is why you are still here on planet Earth. Think about these things. How many of these requests could have been completed if God would have taken you straight to heaven the minute you were, were converted, the minute you were regenerated and born again? and you cried out in faith. How many of these requests? Let's walk through them. Would the church be perfectly unified in heaven? Yes. Will you exist perfectly in Christ in heaven? Yes. Will you end in heaven if you're in heaven? Yes. And will you perfectly embrace the church in heaven? Yes. Can you evangelize the lost in heaven? No, you can't. This is why we are still here. This is not our only purpose. And God has great purposes for accomplishing these other four requests here on earth in the here and now. And so we have to aim for those things. But brothers and sisters, he's given us a commission to go and make disciples. You can't do it. Once you've breathed your last, you won't get to do it when the rapture trumpet sounds. Let's do that here while we have opportunity. Let's pray. Father, you are glorious in your person. Our greatest joy is knowing you and seeing you in all of your glory. And we yearn for that. We want to see that happen. We want your kingdom to come. Father, we trust that your timing is perfect. You have called every saint home who is in heaven now in your perfect timing. And you will do the same for us. Help us, Father, to be patient as we yearn for your kingdom. But help us, Father, to be diligent to do these things you've prayed for us to do while you've given us breath. It's a joy, it's a privilege to serve you. Make us more joyful and more diligent in the task today. And Father, do this so that the world will know and see the glory that is yours, Father, Son, and Spirit, in perfect unity, in perfect trinity. And do this, we ask, Father, so that our joy, our happiness, will increase in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn, take your hymn books. Turn to hymn number 393. Take my life and let it be. Hymn number 393. Take my life and let it be. When you find it, if you're able, would you stand, please?
Let's not pray prayers or sing prayers that we don't mean. That was a rather all-inclusive one, was it not? Everything, my intellect, my affections, my silver, my gold, my hands, my lips, my feet, everything. Use it for you. For our benediction, consider the end of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-24, a barrage of commandments followed by a promise. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but te- prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go in peace, striving to be who Christ prayed you to be, laboring to do what he prayed for you to do, and being confident that God will finish the work in you. Thank you. You are dismissed. Children, come down here.